Atomic Structure, Periodic Table, and Redox Reactions by Lariano Andrade Vicente, MD21, and MCAT Disciples. Just a brief introduction, I scored on the 97th percentile in the new 2016 MCAT. I am the founder and main lecturer for MCAT Disciples, and I could be your new MCAT instructor. Visit MCATDisciple.com to sign up or learn more about our courses, which start at $5.99, a fraction of the industry norm. Without further ado, we begin. This lecture and its contents, unless otherwise noted, are based upon the textbook General Chemistry and Adam's First Approach by Librotex and Howard University. Here is the link. Alright, so before we get to the Schrodinger model of the atom, I wanted to give you a little picture of what the atom kind of looks like. And I say kind of because this isn't exactly accurate. It's not exactly accurate, and I hope that after the end of this lecture, you'll appreciate what is accurate about this and what isn't accurate about this, okay? Before we can get there, we need to talk about quantum mechanics, because the Schrodinger model of the atom is based on quantum mechanics, and particularly wave functions. But again, you don't really need to know quantum mechanics to understand the discussion about the current model, accepted model of the atom. So we'll give you a summary of wave functions. We'll talk about wave functions a little bit just to get a basis, and then we'll move on from that. A wave function is represented by psi, okay, Greek letter psi, and it is a mathematical expression that can be used to calculate any property of any atom. Wave functions for each atom have some property that are exact. All right, well, some of those exact properties is that each wave function describes an electron in a quantum state with a specific um, energy n, and other properties are described by the quantum numbers, which we'll get into, which are n, n, l, m, l, and m, s. Distinct values, okay, distinct values. Um, quantum mechanics is all about distinct values. It's it, distinct integer values, like 1, 2, 3, 4. It can't be 1.1, it can't be 1.2. It has to be 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Additionally, wave functions can be used to calculate average values and probabilities for just about anything. Why are we talking about average? Why are we talking about average probabilities and average distances, etc., etc.? Why are we doing that? Well, it's about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that the more we know about the position of electrons, the less we know about its energy. Well, it's a momentum, which is, again, very much related to energy. And so we have to talk about average distances because we, in the Schrodinger model of the atom, we say we are saying that we know what the energy is. So we have to talk about average distances then, or average positions of electrons. They all go back to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which is really based on the fact that uh, electrons have, part have particles and uh, wave properties associated with them. Okay, let's continue. So let's summarize the wave functions. Wave function, a time independent, there's time dependent and time independent wave function. So we're going to talk about time independent. A time independent wave function uses three variables to describe the position of an electron, x, y, and z, right? And again, this is average distances, okay? This is not exact distances, these are average distances. Um, all right, so here it is here. And again, notice these planes here, this is the x, y plane and the z axis. The total probability of finding an electron anywhere must be 100%, right? It has to be somewhere. The relative phases of functions determines bonding, okay? The relative phases of wave functions for electrons in different atoms determines bonding. And so with constructive interference, when you have constructive interference between the relative waves, uh, you get bonding, okay? And if you get destructive interference, no bonding occurs. That's gonna, you're going to see that later on in a different lecture. So plus and minus, when you're talking about wave functions, indicate phase, okay, not electric charge. If you have two plus phases, that means they're in phase with each other. If you have two minus uh, waves, that means they are um, in phase, with, well, in, they are the same phase. So that just indicates opposite phase. All right, each wave function has a unique set of quantum numbers, right? N, L, M, L, and M, S, four quantum numbers. Each wave function is associated with a particular energy, n, okay? That n is also associated with an average distance from the nucleus. It, they kind of go hand in glove, if you would. Average distance from the nucleus and energy. The energy of an electron is an ad, in an atom is quantized. It can only have certain allowed values, okay? Certain integer numbers. So here are the four quantum numbers. The principal quantum number, the atom methyl quantum number, L, the magnetic quantum number, ML, and the spin quantum number, MS. We're going to go through all four of them. And these quantum numbers, okay, describe the position an electron and the atom and also describe essentially the atomic structure okay it also tells us a lot about energy the principal quantum number n is the, is the shell okay again the mnemonic is shell subshell slot spin shell the principal as the muse of the sub magnetic is the slot or the orbital and spin is the spin okay the principal quantum number n indicates the average distance from the nucleus and the, and the energy of the electron it's the shell quantum number okay 
and that have, may have values of n equals 1, 2, 3, 4, up to infinity. Okay, and that's the principal quantum number n. Again, that indicates the average distance from the nucleus and the energy of the electron. The other yeah, methyl quantum number L describes the shape of the region of the space occupied by the electron. It's the subshell, okay? Shell, subshell, slot, spin. And L can have values of 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n minus 1, okay? And L can equal, so yeah. Notice then that what those normally, I do, what you're probably more familiar with is this notion of S, P, D, and F. And those are just representations of the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3 of the L values. And where do, those, where do those letters come from? Actually, it comes from spectroscopic properties such as sharp of how, of how these subshells look on, on line spectra, okay? So sharp, principal, diffuse, and fundamental. But that's not important for you to know. I'm just allowed values depend on n, rather. The allowed values of L depend on n. So slot, okay, or orbital. It's the magnetic quantum number ML, the slot or the orbital. It, the magnetic quantum number ML describes the orientation of the region in space occupied by an electron with respect to an applied magnetic field. What does that mean? Well, we'll get there soon, the orientation. You, some of that might, you know, stand out to you and make you say, what? What do you mean? So we'll, we'll talk about that later. So ML can have values of negative, negative L to L, okay? So if L was 1, you could have values of negative 1, 0, and 1. Note the allowed values depend on L. The allowed values for ML depend on the last principal quantum number, the other mutual quantum number L. All right, so we move on then to the spin quantum number, ms. It's the magnetic moment of an electron of the electron in an external magnetic field. So let's let's talk about the spin, okay? What is spinning or how it spins is the subject of speculation. We don't really know what's actually spinning. What is indisputable is that electrons do have a magnetic moment, okay? They have that that's so a magnetic dipole which interacts with magnetic fields, and this magnetic moment is called the electric spin. You can either align with the magnetic field, your dipole can align with the magnetic field, or it can align against the magnetic field. If you're aligned with an external magnetic field, you have an ms of plus one half. If you're aligned against 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 the magnetic field, your ms is negative one half. Notice this is the external magnetic field. This one's lined against it, it's pointing in the same pole direction. And so it has a plus, and this is negative. This has been shown to be slightly lower in energy, being aligned with the magnetic field, which makes sense. And all other positions are forbidden. It can't be it can't be oriented like 30 degrees this way. Okay, all those are free. Plus one half or negative one half. And why do we even need the spin quantum number? Why do we need it? It comes down to the Pauli exclusion principle, which says that no two electrons in an atom may have the same values of all four quantum numbers, which is n, l, ml, and ms. And again. Um, if you didn't have that, then the electrons, some electrons would have the same four quantum numbers, so the same, all same values for all the quantum numbers. So that's why we need the spin, just the rationalization at least. So here, again, here are the, uh, the quantum numbers. You have N, L, M, L, M, S. These values come together to describe the properties of the wave functions of an electron, essentially describing then the position of electrons and the average energy of electrons. Okay, and again, N, L, M, L, M, S. The principal quantum number N indicates the average distance from the nucleus and the energy of the electron. L describes the shape of the region of space occupied by the electron. M, L, the magnetic quantum number, describes the orientation in the region of space occupied by an electron with respect to an applied magnetic field. And the spin quantum number M, S, the magnetic moment of, of the electron in an external magnetic field. Shell, subshell, slot, spin. Shell, subshell, slot, spin. Shell, subshell, slot, spin. We'll do some questions now. How many subshells and orbitals are contained within the principal shell of n equals 3? Okay, n equals 3, okay. n equals 3 said, I mean, that there can, we have l values maybe equal to 0 to n, n minus 1. So l has a value of 2. So that means there's three subshells, right? Because if, if, um, if l is equal to 2, then we have 0, 1, 2, or SPD subshells. And if you have SPD subshells, okay, then we have 3s, 3p, 3d, because we're in the n subshell, n, then l equals 0, n, l equals 1, n, l equals 2. And then within each one of these bad boys, there's one, in, there's one um, orbital within the s subshell, right? And then there's 3 within the p subshell, and then there's 5 within the d subshell. So there's 9 orbitals, and n equals 3. But there's shortcuts to that. You can remember that each principal shell n has n subshells. And you can also remember that n squared is equal to the number of orbitals in any principal shell. You can also remember that each principal shell n has 2l plus 1 subshells. Okay, moving on, easy questions. An orbital is a quantum mechanical model of Bohr's electron orbit in a circular path. 
orbitals are regions of space with different probabilities of having an electron. Let's take the simple case of the 1s orbital of hydrogen. The 1s orbital of the sphere, all right, here's the sphere, 1s orbital of hydrogen. The probability of finding an electron depends only on its distance from the nucleus r. For hydrogen, if you look at figure D here, the radial probability, okay, so the radial probability, so this is the wave function squared times the radius squared, and that gives you the radial probability, as a function of the distance from the nucleus. You'll notice that then the radius, right, is about 52.9 picometers distance. That is the most probable distance from the nucleus that you'll find the electron at. So Bohr assumed that this was the distance that the electron and the hydrogen atom would be found all the time, while Schrodinger said that this electron is found here most of the time. Why most? The Heisenberg uncertainty principle, coupled with then the wave particle duality of the electron. Again, you can't really pinpoint the position of a wave, right? And which is an electron, right? And also has particle properties. And you can't really say that then if you know the distance, if you know the position of an electron, that you also know the energy. And since we're saying we know the energy, we cannot say that we know for sure the position of the electron. Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So now let's get a, a a more in-depth uh, in look about the 1s, 2s, and 3s orbitals for hydrogen. Check out this 1s orbital. Again, this is the electron probability, radial probability distance as a function of distance from the nucleus. Check out the 1s orbital, and then check out the 2s. You might know that it's getting bigger. Notice the 3s now is bigger. Notice the nodes as well. What are nodes? Nodes are areas of destructive interference. This is the place where the phases, again, these, these two are different phases, right? This is positive phase, this is negative phase. So where they in overlap, you're going to get destructive interference and you're going to have a node. <clears throat> no electrons can exist there. Remember, wave and particle properties of electrons. All right, so now we're going to talk about the different types of or, uh, subshells, okay? S, P, D, and F. So S orbitals. Three things occur as N becomes larger, okay? The first thing that they become, the orbitals become larger, extending further from the nucleus. They contain more nodes, and they become higher in energy because of increased distance from the nucleus via Coulomb's law. What is Coulomb's law? I'm going to be talking about it day and night throughout this lecture. So what is Coulomb's law? Coulomb's law is F electrostatic is equal to K big Q little Q over R squared. Okay, it says that for oppositely, for oppositely charged particles, if you increase distance, you're going to de decrease force of attraction. If you decrease distance, you're going to increase force of attraction. That's what Coulomb's law says. You need to know that, you need to understand that, because that is going to be the entire basis of this lecture. P orbitals. As L increases, the number of orbitals in any given subshell increases, and the shapes of the orbitals become larger and more complex. For example, if n is equal to 2, then, then we may have 0 to n minus 1 subshell, then L is equal to 1 is equal to P. That means we can, for P, we can have negative 1 to plus 1 orbitals, right? Because, again, this the orbitals are determined by, are limited by what the L as a mutual quantum number is. So within each P orbital, uh, within each P subshell, we have three orbitals. Or so we have three P orbitals, all right? It's negative one, zero, and one, PX, PY, and PD. Again, um, P orbitals have a bilobe shaped and are oriented on an axis, either X, Y, or Z. Each one of these P orbitals is associated with a nodal, pain, nodal plane in the remaining axes, which makes sense because this is the position where overlapping occurs. Hence, destructive interference occurs because, again, electrons have wave properties, and those wave properties will then cause for destructive interference where the phases are not in phase, okay? So notice that this is the positive phase, this is the negative phase. Over here in this area, this XY node plane, that is where overlap occurs, and that's where all of these kind of meet, and then everything, everything there in that area, okay, is going to cause for then destructive interference, and you're going to get a plane. No electrons can exist here. A node, rather. No electrons can exist here. This is a nodal plane. So in the px orbital, you have this bilobe bi p orbital here. There is a nodal plane in the xy. Nodal, the next y nodal plane. Sorry, a zy nodal plane. And um, here, again, when the y is oriented on the y-axis, there is a nodal plane in the zx um, axis, etc., etc. Okay? D orbitals. D orbitals have subshells with L equals 2 and have 5 D orbitals. The first shell to have a D orbital is N equals 3. Again, again, since you have a value of m d, well, l equals 2, you can have negative 2 to 2 um, d orbitals, so 5 d orbitals. 
one, two, three, four, five, okay? And you don't really have to know these shapes of the D orbitals. You just can know that each has two perpendicular nodal planes at least. Um, but yeah, they're, they're complex and you're not going to be asked questions about D orbitals. Could look at this thing, man. And then F orbitals. The first shell to have an F orbital is N equals 4. You don't have to worry about the shapes of F orbitals. They can have subshells of L equals 3, right? Because again, N minus 1 is negative 3 to 3. Right? So that's how many subshells it can have. Don't concern yourself with shapes and orientation of F orbitals again. Those are the orbitals, guys. Not confusing at all. So note the trend. As N increases, possible values of L increases. As L increases, the orbitals become larger and more complex. As N increases, the associated orbitals become larger. We talked about all three of these things. And notice the difference between this one and this one. I'm saying as L increases, orbitals become larger and more complex. As N increases, the associated orbitals become larger. So, you know, the S orbital is smaller than the P orbital, as a general notion, right? But the 1S orbital is smaller than the 2S orbital, right? That's what I'm saying. 1S orbital is smaller than 2S, 2P orbital is smaller than the 3P orbital, etc., etc. So, orbital energies. In a hydrogen atom, all orbitals with the same n value are degenerate, meaning they have the same energy. See, notice that these are degenerate. Degenerate means that they have the same energy. The, all, the 3s, 3p, and 3d, 4 hydrogen atom, now, for, because that's important, 4 hydrogen atom are degenerate. But that's not the case for any other atom, and you will see why in a moment. So, you'll also notice that the biggest energy difference is between the 1s and the 2s orbital. And that comes from this equation. E is equal to negative Z, that's the atomic number, squared over N squared, the principal quantum number, uh, times the Rydberg constant times Planck's constant times the speed of light. So, again, because it's squared, right? So the different, as soon, when you start squaring this term, this, this, this value gets so big and big and big that the difference in energy gets lower and lower and lower. But anyway, let's say you excite an electron from N equals 1 to N equals 2. And you can excite that electron via heating it up, let's say, or hitting it with a photon. So you excite the electron from n equals 1 to n equals 2. Well, when that electron de-excitates, when it drops back down from n equals 2 to n equals 1, it's going to release a photon. And that photon is going to have an energy corresponding exactly to the difference in energy between n equals 1 and n equals 2. Exactly. The same. It's going to be exactly the same. And you know what? If an MCAT question asks you, and this is another thing, if an MCAT question asks you, is the energy difference between n equals 1 and n equals 2 the same as the energy energy difference between n equals 2 and n equals 3? The answer is no. Clearly, the biggest difference is between n equals 1 and n equals 2. Anything else is going to have a smaller value in terms of the difference in energy, unless they jump from, let's say, n equals 3, n equals 1, rather, to n equals 3. Of course, then that's going to have a bigger energy difference. But if you're only doing one jump, you know, up one shell or down one shell, the biggest energy difference is going to be between n equals 1 and n equals 2. But anyway, the fact that these guys are degenerate is only the case for a single electron atom. It's not the case for any other element which we'll see soon. And the reason for that soon we'll see as well. Atomic structure, effective nuclear charges. Let's talk about that, and then we can understand why subshells and multi-electron atoms are not degenerate. V is the atomic number that is the nuclear charge or the number of protons within the atom, and incidentally, the number of electrons as well in a, an element in its ground state that is its unionized state, aka its elemental state. Whereas the ZF, or the Z effective, is the effective nuclear charge felt by an electron, not just the number of protons within the atom. And when we say the Z effective of lithium, we're usually referring to the outermost electrons within the atom, known as the valence electrons. But of course, any electron within a, 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 an element can have its own Z effective, uh, and, and that can be calculated. But to further understand what this term means, let's look at these images here, shall we? Let's start with the hydrogen atom. It's a one electron system, one proton, one electron, the Z is equal to one, the nuclear charge is equal to plus one, and the Z effective is also plus one. Let's look at helium, a two electron system. That Z is equal to two, however, that Z effective is not equal to two, it's a little bit less. It's 1.68. Again, don't, mem don't memorize that number. Lithium, the Z is equal to three, but the Z effective is equal to 1.3, plus 1.3. Rubidium, uh, the Z is equal to 37, however, the Z effective is equal to plus five. 
These Z effectives are changing due to the effect of electron shielding, which is when electrons shield or diminish the nuclear charge felt by any given electron, hence the name effective nuclear charge. So the charge that the outermost electron feels isn't the same charge as the amount of protons within the nucleus. It's different. It's lower. And that is why we have the term effective nuclear charge. So why? So what's bringing that about, and what are the trends? Let's let's talk. Let's talk about that. Here's our periodic table, and I'll start by moving from left to right, starting with lithium and moving all the way over to neon, and we'll understand the trend and why it's happening. As we move from left to right, we're adding protons plus three, plus four, plus five, plus six, plus seven, etc. Um, and we're also adding electrons, right? As we move up the Z, we also get an electron added. Um, and it turns out that electrons within the same shell are not very effective at shielding their fellow electrons. So the Z effective actually increases as we move from left to right on the table, as denoted in purple by the Z effect. So again, look, start at 1.3 and at 5.1. Now you'll notice it is the Z effective is always lower than the Z. But the, the trend is that Z effective is increasing from left to right. Here is the analogy. Imagine the nucleus as the sun. And imagine shielding as providing shade from the sun. If you put people standing next to you, rather than in between you and the sun, you won't be very well shaded from the sun. Sure, you might get a little bit depending on how close uh, you they are to you, but not that much, right? So hold that thought. Our trend from left to right is increasing and in the effective. Now let's go down the column starting at lithium to cesium. As we go down, we are adding a tremendous amount of protons and a, an equal amount of electrons, right? Just like we were doing from left to right. But unlike before, we are adding inner N shell electrons every time we move downward. And these inner shell electrons are very good at shielding. So we will notice that the Z effective of lithium is 1.3, but the Z effective of cesium is only plus 6, whereas it has a nuclear charge or a number of protons of plus 55. So again, back to our analogy, if the nucleus is the sun and you put people in between you and the sun, you're going to be very well shaded from the sun, hence the rays you feel or the effective nuclear charge these outermost electrons will feel is much less um, than the actual charge of the nucleus or the intensity of the sun. So with that said, you'll also notice, unfortunately, this is an unfortunate reality, that Z effective is actually slightly increasing as we go down the column. However, however, folks, I would encourage you to think of it as not changing at all because it's a reasonable simplification and the change that is occurring is massively outweighed by the electronic repulsive effects that produce the other periodic trend we will learn about. And I can absolutely promise you that if you make the simplification or even if you think of the Z effective as decreasing as you go down the column, the only question you would ever get wrong from thinking that way is if the question specifically asks what is the Z-effective trend, which they rarely do. And the reason why this is so important is that you can use the Z-effective trends to understand um, the other periodic trends so that you don't have to memorize them and you can simply use the Z-effective trend to derive any trend that you need and then you can't accidentally mix it up on test day or anything like that. We'll continue with this uh, through a visual representation. You'll notice again that lithium has a Z effective of about one and fluorine has a Z effective of about five. So the Z effective is increasing from left to right because electrons within the same end shell are not very effective at shielding one another, just like friends standing next to you are not very effective at providing shade from the sun. So if we look at lithium and fluorine here, which are represented visually, and I can try to zoom in here to help us. Here we have lithium and fluorine. They both have two innermost electrons. Lithium has one valence electron as shown here. Fluorine has seven as shown here. Lithium has a nuclear charge of plus three, three protons. Fluorine has nine protons within its nucleus. 
and the Z effective is increasing from left to right because these outermost electrons that were added at the same time the protons were added to form fluorine are not effective at shielding one another just like your buddies at the beach aren't very good at shielding you if they're standing next to you as opposed to in between you and the sun and that'll be much more obvious when we compare lithium to cesium. Now let's compare now lithium versus cesium. You'll notice that again lithium has a Z effective of 1.3 but cesium has a Z effective of about plus 6. But the nuclear charge of cesium is plus 55 man that's a lot of, of, of protons. While well, lithium is only plus three. So that drastic disparity between nuclear charge and the Z effective is due to electronic shielding. Relating again back to our analogy that friends standing in between you and the sun will provide much more shade no matter how intense it is. Um, and and to, to look at this visually, all of these electrons are standing in between the valence electron like this one. Looks like there's only one, so this one. But all of these suckers are standing in between the sun which is a positive charge, plus 55, and the outermost electron here, the valence electron. And so that's why this is really feeling a charge of plus 6 and not plus 55. And, of course, that has ramifications for size and such. And again, while the Z effective is slightly increasing as we move down the column, I would encourage you to think about it as either constant or decreasing. And again, you'll never get a question wrong other than asking directly for the Z effective if you did that. And things are just, and the other reason to do that is that things will make more sense if you think about it that way. It'll make a lot more sense and you won't trick yourself up or trip yourself up. And I know this is a contentious topic and if you Google this, you will find things that are different from what I presented to you today. Oh, I can assure you that I made my best efforts to ensure what I presented is correct and I'm quite certain that it is. But please feel free to review these articles and convince yourself as well. But now we will come back to the concept of non-degenerate orbitals in multi-system atoms. Atomic structure, orbital energy. In a multi-electron atom, all orbitals within a shell are not degenerate. This is the opposite of what we said for the hydrogen atom, which is the single electron atom. Okay? These energy differences are due to the combinatory effects of shielding and penetrance. We talked about shielding, right? But for example, let me give you for penetrance. An electron in the 2s orbital penetrates inside the filled 1s orbital. Okay? It overlaps with the 1s orbital. More than a 2p orbital does, because the 2p orbital is slightly further away. Hence, in an atom with a filled 1s orbital, the z effective experienced by a 2s electron is greater than the z effective experienced by a 2p electron, because it's closer, right? Consequently, the 2s electron is more tightly bound to the nucleus and has a lower energy than the 2p orbital. That's why the 2s orbital is lower in energy than 2p orbital. It's about penetrance and, and, and z effective and attractive forces, right? Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law. The closer you are, the more attracted you are, lower in energy you are. Note that the differences in energies between subshells can become so large, like for th so large, that the energies of the orbitals from different principal shells are roughly equal or um, overlap so much that the 3D is higher than the 4S, which is the big one. Notice that the 3D is higher than the 4S. That has ramifications, which we'll talk about soon in terms of the transition metals. Note the trend. Due to electron shielding, the Z effective increases going across a row of the periodic table and remains constant going down a column of the periodic table. And I'll recall that this is a simplification. It really is slightly increasing. But again, I encourage you to think of it as constant or even decreasing. And if you, again, if you thought about it as decreasing, you'd get every question about other trends for the periodic table correct. Z effective is always lower than Z except for hydrogen. Summary, the atomic structure. Quantum numbers provide information about energy and spatial distribution of an electron. But the principal quantum number n can be any positive number, and as n increases, the average distance of the electron from the nucleus also increases. It is the shell. Remember shell slub, sub slot spin. The atom, the atom muthal quantum number l can have integral values between 0 and n minus 1. It describes the shape of the electron distribution. It is the subshell, and that can have um, S, P, D, and F, so the S, P, D, and F are just representations of the yeah, the methyl quantum number L, 0 is equal to S, 1 is equal to P, 2 is equal to D, and 3 is equal to F. The magnetic quantum number M, L can have 2L plus 1 integral values, ranging from negative L to L, and describe the orientation of the electron distribution. It is the slot orbital. 
all right, the orientation, right? Because again, this is going to be px, and that's going to the the p orbital is going to be oriented on the x-axis and have a zy nodal plane. This is going to be, you know, this could be py, and this could be pd, right? So that's what that means in terms of orientation. And the spin quantum number ms describes the magnetic moment of an electron in an external magnetic field. It can have plus one half or minus one half. Plus one half is aligned with the external magnetic field. Negative one half is line, aligned against the magnetic field. This is slightly more higher, lower in energy than this one. It's been shown experimentally. And that's the spin quantum number. Each wave function with a given set of n, l, and ml values describe the particular spatial distribution of an electron in an atom in a, an atomic orbital. ms describes the spin as per the Pauli exclusion principle said that no two electrons can have the same four quantum numbers. And I'm going to say it here, even though I didn't write it here, and I, because I mentioned it. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that the more we know about an electron's position, the less we, know, we can know about the momentum, or, and that's very related to the energy. So the more we can know about position, the less we know about energy. And because the Schrodinger model said that we know the energy, we can only use, uh, approximate the position of an electron. That's why we say we talk about average probabilities and radial probabilities, because we cannot say for exact certainty where it is, because that would violate then the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And that all runs back to that wave-particle duality that, that um, electrons have both wave and particle properties. How can you really pinpoint the position of a wave? Continuing with the summary, there's four chemically important orbitals that correspond to the values of L equals 0, 1, 2, 3. We talked about this, S, P, D, and F. P orbitals contain one nodal plane and they're bilobe dumbbell shape, right? And they're oriented on each P orbital is oriented on some axis and has a corresponding nodal plane in the remaining axes. D orbitals have at least two nodal planes that have complex shapes that we don't need to know, and F orbitals have a lot of stuff in complex shape and planes. Because the average distance determines the energy of an electron, each atomic orbital with a given set of quantum numbers has a particular energy associated with it, and that's the orbital energy. Again, average. Why average? Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If single electron systems, if it's a single electron system, orbitals with the same n value are degenerate. If it's a multiple electron system, orbital energy increasing increases with value with L value increases because of electron shielding and penetrance. Electron shielding is when intervening electrons act to reduce the positive nuclear charge experienced by the N electron. The effective positive charge felt by any given electron is the effective. We usually talk about the effective in terms of the valence electron. That, because again, you can have a Z effective for like, you know, the middle shell electrons, but we never talk about the Z effective for that because what's the point? All right, the, what's, what determines the chemistry of an uh, element is the valence electrons. And we talk about penetrance, which is the degree to which over orbitals overlap. We said those have a combinatorial effect to to give us the fact that um, multiple in a multiple electron system, orbitals are not degenerate within the same n value. Degenerate means that they're the same energy level. In a multiple electron system, the orbitals within the same n value are not degenerate. All right. So an example, you should be trying and doing these examples before I do them for you. Otherwise, you know, you're really not learning. So Q1, list all the allowed combinations of the four quantum numbers for electrons in a 3p orbital and predict the maximum number of electrons that a 3p orbital can accommodate. So I've done them for you. Here are the answers. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and try to do them for you. It's kind of, it's kind of simple, really. Uh, you should also be able to do this for using probability. You shouldn't have to write all this out. You should be able to say that, you know, there's three different possibilities for this number, right? It can be negative 1, 0, 1. So that's 3. And then you should say there's two different possibilities for this number. It can be plus one half or negative one half. So three times two is equal to six. Six possible combinations. Use probability to find these things out quickly. You don't have to write all this out. You need to be able to use probability. It's a general skill that you should be able to apply to different situations like this. Now that we cover the Schrodinger atom, let's move on to building the periodic table. So the electron configuration of an element is the arrangement of its electrons in its atomic orbitals. If you know the electron configuration of an element, you can predict and explain a great deal of its chemistry. Very important. That's why I spend so much time on this, is because it's very important. It makes general chemistry very much easier for you. All the things that seem magical about our <coughs> general chemistry, if you know this, become less and less magical and more and more real. All right. So the periodic table is constructed using the Aufbau, or the building up principle. The Aufbau principle says that we add electrons to the lowest energy orbital available making sure not to violate the Pauli principle nor the Hund bus rule. And Hund's bus rule said that an electron will prefer its own orbital before entering an orbital with an electron in it. That's interesting. Why do you think that is? Coulomb's law. The orbitals are degenerate, meaning that they are at the same energy level. So 
So adding an electron to a filled orbital when there's an empty orbital at the same energy level as the orbital beside it would add unnecessary electronic repulsion. So that's why electrons would prefer to get their own orbital as opposed to an orbital that's already filled when there are unfilled orbits. That's why it's called the bus rule. When you get on a bus, you'd much rather sit by yourself before you sit next to a person. So all the seats have to be filled before electrons start filling um, orbitals with electrons already in it. And again, that's the uh, Hund rule, Hund's bus rule. All right, I'll follow. <clears throat> all right, so let's just build up the periodic table. Let's do it. Um, molecular orbitals, right? So here's hydrogen. Here, here's what it looks like in terms of the 1s has one electron, right? We add an electron to the 1s orbital and helium, and we also added a proton, right? That's what it looks like. Lithium, that's what it looks like. Beryllium, boron. I'm moving through this very quickly because it doesn't really point. But when we get to carbon, what should carbon look like? Should it look like this? Should it look like this? Should it look like this? Well, this one, of course, is a no-go. It violates Hans' rule, right? Hans' bus rule. What about these two? It's been shown that this guy is lower in energy. You know what? Because when you line up spins in parallel, you're going with the magnetic field, and that's low. tends to be lower in energy than going against the magnetic field. So this one's out. Because, again, this is a slightly higher in energy than being um, with the magnetic, external magnetic field. Okay. Again, electrons in degenerate orbit would like to line their spin up in parallel. One of the rationales is that this notion of the spin up being slightly lower in energy. So we can continue with nitrogen, then oxygen, fluorine, neon. Again, note that filled orbitals and half filled orbitals are stable and lower in energy. Lithium, okay. So we can also simplify things. We can use the bracket notation. Bracket notation is this notion right here. And it's simplified form showing only the configuration of the valence shell. So the valence shell for lithium is just, has just 2s1. Because electrons in filled inner orbitals are closer to the nucleus and by coulombs are more tightly held, they are rarely involved in chemical reactions. The valence electrons in the outermost shell, or the end principal quantum shell, are the reactive ones because they are very distant from the nucleus. Okay, Coulomb's law. If you're farther away from the nucleus, you're less attracted to that nucleus, and then you are more able and more free to react with other positively charged or negatively charged uh, particles in the area. And that makes you more reactive, then. That makes you higher in energy. It is apparent that both these fellas here, both these guys, have one S electron in their valence shell. We therefore predict that they have very similar chemistry, which is indeed the case. So when you have a similar Valence shell in terms of electron, you all tend to have very similar chemistry. And that's important, man. Listen, the valent electron is what's important in determining chemistry. Okay? And again, let me make this clear because I don't know if I made this clear yet. When we talk about energy and high energy, low energy, you have to be very careful. So, if you're attracted to the nucleus, you are considered low in energy. Even though the force of attraction is greater, that makes you more stable because you're less reactive. That's the kind of energy we're talking about. So, if you're further away from the nucleus, so you're a valent electron, you're actually higher in energy. As we increase the principal quantum number n, energy increases because force of attraction decreases because you're further away from the nucleus for one reason. So keep that in mind in terms of energy. That's what we mean, reactivity and stability. You're stable if you're attracted. You're unstable if you're unattracted or further from the nucleus, right? Because Coulomb's law is k big q little q of r squared. So you increase r, you decrease force of attraction, you increase energy. Not force of attraction energy, but energy reactivity energy. So here's an example. Draw the orbital diagram and use it to derive the electron configuration for phosphorus, which is Z equals 15. What's its valence configuration? Feel free to pause and do this. That's the point of these things. But here's the answer. Um, I probably didn't give you enough time to pause, but the valence configuration is 3s2, 3p3. We got that from here because we just built up the periodic table. Um, making sure not to violate the Pauli principle that no two electrons can have the same four principal quantum numbers and making sure we don't violate the Hans bus rule by making sure these things fill up uh, with their things up in parallel and take empty seats before taking up seats that have electrons in it. And here the, um, here's the shorthand bracket notation. This is what you'll be using on the MCAT. So how do you do that? Well, the one way you can do it, and you know the order, one way you can do it is you can build up, right? I mean, the order is the order because, you know, and as we increase and energy increases, right? So then 1s should be lower in energy than 2s, and 2s should be higher in lower in energy than 3s. But this is the order. If you follow this, you go 1s, right? Then 2s, 
then 2p, 3s. So you keep doing that all the way down. If you memorize this chart, you don't have to write everything out. Well, you're not going to have to write anything out, period. But if you wanted to know the longhand rotation to do this, you just have to remember this chart to get the electron configuration. That's what they're called, by the way, electron configurations. So again, generally speaking, as we increase n, the energy of the shell increases. But the 4s orbital actually happens to be lower in energy than the 3d orbital. Why do you think that is? And that's because of shielding and penetration effects, like we talked about. But we also have to consider radial distance from the nucleus in half-filled orbitals, okay? But the point of the matter is that the 3D, the 3D uh, orbital is actually higher in energy than the 4S orbital, but the 4S orbital is further away from the nucleus. And this is the probability density, okay? Likelihood that you're going to find an electron as a function of radial distance from the nucleus, and the 4S is actually further away. So that is why, as you'll see soon, that we have some exceptions in terms of filling of orbitals, in terms of 4S and 3D with the transition metals. They have a funky electron configuration at times. Here is an exercise for you. Please write out the electronic configuration for lead, showing all the inner orbitals, and also just do a shorthand notation for good practice. Here's the answer. So now let's find the electron configuration for chromium. If you were to do it, you would, you would expect it to look like this. 4s2, 3d4, because we usually fill up the 4s and then we fill up the 3d, right? Because the 4s is um, lower in energy than 3d. But what actually is the case is 4s1, 3d5. Why do you think that is? What's the reason for this exception? You probably wouldn't know if I, if I didn't tell you. I mean, this is something that you just have to rationalize and remember the rationalization. And the rationalization for this is the fact that there is stability associated with half-filled and fully-filled orbitals. And when you line up the 3D orbitals with their spins in parallel like you do here, right, it actually tends to be lower in energy than having a 4s2, 3d4 configuration. And we want the lowest energy configuration possible. So that's why the exception here is with chromium is looks like this, the fact that it's 4s1, 3d5. And actually, when you lose electrons from chromium, you're going to lose the 4s electrons before the 3d5 electrons because, again, having electrons with their spins lined up in parallel and half-filled orbital has associated with low energy, the low energy state. Also recall that the 4s is further out from the nucleus than the 3d. Remember that radial probability, it's further out. The, the peak is further out. And so it's more reactive because it's, it's more likely to come into contact with other molecules than atoms and be more reactive in that sense. And that's why it loses its electron first before the 3d orbitals do. So let's continue. Let's find the electron configuration for copper. Again, if you were to do this on your own and you didn't know about the exception, you would expect it to look like this. But in reality, it doesn't look like that. It looks like this. And again, there is stability associated with half-filled and fully-filled orbitals. And so this is more stable than this. And so there's another exception. Try one more. Let's try gold. So note the trend. Again, additional stability is associated with half-filled and fully-filled orbital. When we say something is stable, that means it's lower in energy. But is there an easier way to get the electron configuration? Yes, there's a much easier way to get the electron configuration. There's no need to write out all this crap we've been writing out, truly. All we need to use is the periodic table. The periodic table is set up in blocks, okay? And you can see that there is an S block, a D block, a P block, and an F block. The F block would actually be right here between 6S and 7S and 4F and 5F, I mean 5D and 6D. But that doesn't matter, you're probably never gonna use this block. So this is how this works. Let me show you how this works. Well, you see how this works. So this is 2s1, this is 2s2, this is 2p1, 2p2, 2p3, 2p4, 2p5, 2p6. This tells you the electron configuration, the entirety of the electron configuration, not just the valence, because then you can go back and say 1s1, 1s2, 1s1. Again, here's 3d, here's 3d1, here's 3d2, 3d3, 3d4. So if I wanted to get this up, this atom's electron configuration, right, this element electron configuration right here, it'd be 4s2. The valence electron would be 4s2, and this would, I think this is neon, so this would be neon, bracket neon, 4s2. Well, 3s2, if it, I forgot which one I was pointing at. But that's how that works, okay? So we'll go through an example. Let's find the configuration for carbon and phosphorus. So lithium's 2s1, right? This is S block, S block. Then it's 2s2, then it's 2p1. 2p2. So carbon's valence electron configuration is 2s2, 2p2. 
Well, helium, so yeah. And its whole configuration would be bracketed helium, 2s2, 2p2. What about phosphorus? Let's get phosphorus. Well, it's 3s1, 3s2, 3p1, 3p2, 3p3. So phosphorus, <coughs> valence electron configuration is 3s2, 3p3. Again, how useful this is. Extremely useful. Okay, I told you already that if you know the valence electron configuration for an element, then you can predict the vast degree of its chemistry because you know the valency that it is most likely to adopt. Let's do another one. This is an exercise for you, so I'm not going to do this for you. Um, pause the video and do this yourself. Here are the answers. Okay. Atomic structure. Summary. The concept of electron spin has ramifications for chemistry because the Pauli exclusion principle implies that no orbital can exist with more than two electrons with opposite spins. Using this and an understanding of orbital energies based on distance from the nucleus, penetrance, and electron shielding, one can construct the periodic table by filling up the available orbitals beginning with the lowest energy orbitals. And that's the Aufbau building up principle, which gives rise to a particular arrangement of electrons for each element, its electron configuration. The electron configuration, again, is a particular arrangement of electrons. Hund's rule, or the bus rule, said that the lowest energy arrangement of electrons is one that places them in degenerate orbitals with their spins in parallel. And we also came up with those exceptions where, well, not exceptions, well, exceptions to our building up rule in the sense that we fill up 3Ds before we fill up 4S, even though the 4, well, the 4S is higher in energy than, well, the 3D is higher in energy than the 4S, but we fill up the 3D energy first, 3 orbitals first in terms of half-filled and fully-filled orbitals because those are lower energy, and one of the rationalizations is that, that the spins are completely in parallel. Well, in terms of the 3D5, at least. But again, uh, the stability associated with half-filled and fully-filled orbitals. If you have the opportunity to half-fill or fully-fill an orbital, you should go ahead and do that with the electron configurations. The most important electrons in terms of chemical properties and reactivity are those in the outermost principal shell, the valence electrons. The arrangement of atoms in the periodic table results in blocks corresponding to filling the NS, NP, ND, and NF orbitals to produce distinctive chemical properties of the elements in the S block, P block, D block, and F block, respectively. That's very important. You should be able to use that periodic table to get the valence electron configuration very quickly. The periodic trend, the tonic radii. Don't fall into the trap of thinking of atoms as small spherical marbles. You already know that wave function boundaries are not clearly defined, and we have to talk about the probability of finding electron in terms of average, uh, in terms of probabilities, not radii distance of the waves. Recall that probability of finding electron in orbitals falls off slowly with increasing distance, as we see here in this figure, in terms of radial probability of the function of distance from the nucleus. So it is impossible to have a distinct boundary for a radii. Also notice the peaks of radial probability for each ns or np orbital. The peak for n equals 1 occurs at successively shorter distances for neon and argon. So this is um, helium, this is neon, this is argon. Why do you think that is? It's because this greater number of protons than nuclei are more positively charged and more attractive via Coulomb's law. Because again, these guys in the 1s orbitals, there's the effect of essentially z. And so every time you add protons, the 1s orbital is closer and closer to the the nuclei. Again, because of Coulomb's law. K, big Q, little q over R squared. So, the, but the, the point of this is that we have to approximate the radii of atoms by looking at them in in molecules. You can't look at them in terms of um, atoms because it's not the, the they're not clearly defined, and it becomes difficult then to measure what the radii is. So we have different ways of measuring the radii again because we can't do it by by elements. So we have to do them while they're in molecules. Obviously, that has its own problems, right? Because different molecules are gonna have different forces of attraction on each other and make them slightly smaller or slightly bigger. But we use the covalent radii, and for metals, we use the metallic radii. Um, just another thing to mention, atomic radii is on the uh, order of picometers. So like the atomic radii for carbon is about 77 picometers. But again, we use this guy, and we use this guy. So let's check out this figure. It's a plot of variation of atomic radius with atomic number for the first six rows of the periodic table. I hope you're seeing how to read this. This is telling you the key, so this would be this would be um, hydrogen, this would be helium, and then this would be lithium, and then the next one would be, I don't know what comes after lithium, but you get the idea, that's how you read that. Um, notice that when you increase principal quantum number n, the atomic radii becomes much larger. And then you keep adding, you keep adding um, protons, okay, and electrons, you notice that they actually get smaller. But then we jump a principal quantum number again, and it gets larger again, and then it becomes smaller, smaller, smaller. 
We'll talk about why that is very shortly. So notice the trend, the periodic trend. Atomic radius is decreasing up and to the right. Up and to the right, atomic radius is decreasing. This is a very good figure, and this this would always help me remember that atomic radius decreases up and to the right. I mean, I could always derive it, but this image is very memorable, so you should be able to remember this. How the size this is relatively accurate, by the way, in terms of size. The trends of an atomic size are ramifications of electron shielding and effective nuclear charges. Right? The greater the effective by Coulomb's law, the more strongly the outermost electrons are attracted to the nucleus and the smaller the atomic radius. Again, that's what I just said. The trend in atomic size, the ramifications of electron shielding, and the resulting effective nuclear charge, the effective. So let's check out the second row to visualize the effective electron shield. And this is the second row. As we move from lithium to neon, okay? The nuclear charge is increasing from plus 3 to plus 10. That's a nuclear charge. Although electrons are being added as we traverse the row, electrons in the same principal shell are not very effective at shielding one another from the nuclear charge. We talked about this notion. The notion is that when you add electrons to the same principal shell, they are the electrons are very much less likely to be beside each other as opposed to in front of each other, and so they cannot block elect the nuclear charge very much the way that electrons in inner shells can block nuclear charge. So as you move to the right, you're adding positive charge, which you're not getting as much shielding, so the effective increases, and therefore, by Coulomb's law, the electrons are held more tightly, and the radius of the atoms decreases. So that's that's why we have that trend in terms of adding protons and neutrons to the same principal shell. So now moving down a column, the atomic size increases. So why is that? Why is it that the atomic size increases as we move down the column? Well, starting at lith lithium, as we go down the group one elements, we'll notice that we're going from n, principal quantum number n, 2, to n is equal to 6, all the way at cesium. But the nuclear charge is increasing from plus 3, as shown here, all the way to plus 55. So why are the atoms getting bigger? If you know by Coulomb's law, if you increase the big Q, and I, again, let me just write this very quickly, you know that Coulomb's law is K, big Q, little Q over R squared. And you know that opposites attract. And you know that if you increase big Q, you are proportionally going to increase the force of attraction and hence make the atom smaller. So what's going on? Why have I drawn cesium accurately so, so much bigger than lithium? Two pieces, electron shielding. And there's one more piece to it, electronic repulsion. If this cesium... Uh, the valence electron that this cesium atom was actually feeling a plus 55 charge, this cesium atom would be tiny, absolutely tiny, but it doesn't. It actually feels a plus 6, right? That's the Z effective for the valence electrons of the cesium atom. And so that's part of the reason why it's absolutely ginormous. But you would also say, hey, Loriana, still, let's look at Coulomb's law and let's say K big Q, little Q over R squared, the cesium big Q is still bigger than the lithium big Q. So what the heck is going on still? Well, you know, well, maybe you don't. Um, you know, well, you, I think you know this, that uh, opposites attract and like repulses. So two electrons will actually repulse one another. And while they are attracted to the nucleus, they can also repulse themselves. And so what's going to end up happening is they're going to be positioning themselves in the ideal position in space such that they minimize repulsion and maximize attraction to the nucleus. And so the resulting size is as you see here. And now you know that as we go down the column, we're adding a ginormous amount of electrons, and those electrons take up space and end up repulsing their little buddies and have to find this optimal positioning. So as we go down the column, uh, the atomic radii increases. You, you also heard that I almost said molecule before molecule is at least two atoms bound together by bonds. But we're dealing with atoms, one element. Note the trend. Electrons in the same principal shell are not very effective at shielding one another from the nuclear charge, whereas electrons filled in inner shells are highly effective at shielding electrons in outer shells from the nuclear charge. Finally, you've seen this slide before, but I added one thing in bold red, so hopefully you'd never forget it. And that is that the trend in atomic size the ramifications of electron shielding the resulting effective nuclear charge and also electronic repulsion. So you don't forget. Sorry if that was loud. So I'm going to exercise this for you. Please pause the video and give these a go. Read the answer. Exercise 2. Arrange these elements in order of increasing atomic size. That's the answer. The periodic trends. Ions. 
An ion is formed when an electron is added or removed from a neutral atom. Cations are always smaller than its parent neutral atom. Anions are always larger than the parent neutral atom. Why do you think that is? What are the equations that I always use to make sense of these things? I'll let you think about it. Cations and anions. Cations. Two things occur when electrons are removed from a neutral atom. The first is that repulsion between electrons in the same principal shell decreases because of less electrons. Okay. The second thing is the effective increases because there are less electrons to shield one another from the nucleus, so decreased size probability region. If attractive force increases, of course the elect the atom is going to get smaller. Two things occur when electrons. The opposite occurs when two when electrons are added to a neutral atom. The first is that increased electronic repulsion. Second is that the effective decreases because there are more electrons to shield one another, so then increased size probability region. Simple guys, simple. And so here's another chart showing uh, the ions uh, popped on here. And notice that these valencies, we're going to talk about these valencies and which, you know, what, which valencies are more likely to be adopted by an element. But check out how cesium, um, the ion is in, is in like this gray here. And the, this is the normal element. And then the ion is here. Obviously, it's smaller. But over here, um, this gray portion is actually a lot larger than the actual element. Again, because these guys are adding electrons, these guys are losing electrons. So these guys are forming cations, these guys are forming anions. So, an isoelectronic series. An isoelectronic series compares the size of atoms or ions with the same number of electrons but different nuclear charges. So these guys all have the same number of electrons but they have different nuclear charges. How is that possible? Well, let's start at, let's start at oxygen. Well, let's start at nitrogen. Nitrogen gained three electrons, so now it's right here in terms of electrons. It's where neon is. Oxygen gains two electrons, so now it's right here, where, right where neon is. Fluorine gains one electron, so it's right at neon now in terms of electrons. Sodium loses an electron, so now it's at neon. Okay. Magnesium loses two electrons, so now it's at neon in terms of electrons. Okay, same thing with aluminum. Now it's at neon because it lost three. So though all of those have the same number of electrons, but they have different nuclear charges. They didn't lose any protons in this process. And so this demonstrates then that as positive charges of the nucleus increases while the number of electrons remain the same, by Coulomb's law, they're the decrease in radius. Of course, aluminum is much smaller. First off, it lost electrons, but it has the same number of electrons as the other guys, but it has a much stronger nuclear charge. So, of course, it's smaller. And that's what an isoelectronic series is all about. Same number of electrons, but different nuclear charges. So, we got some exercises for you. Go ahead and do these. Pause the video. That's the answer. Pause the video. That's the answer. So here's the thinking question for you. What are sulfur's most common valency adopted under normal chemical conditions? Uh, if you have no idea, you have no idea. But the answer is C. So we'll go over why in very shortly. And I told you earlier that knowing the electron configuration tells you a great deal about an element's chemistry. So what we're going to do next is to learn how to predict whether an element will take on or lose electrons and the relative energy is associated with that ion formation. So the first thing we're going to talk about is another periodic trend, which is ionization energy. So this is ionization, right? Ionization is the energy it takes to remove an electron from an element. That's what ionization energy is. The energy it takes to remove an electron from an element or atom, really. It's always positive. It's always positive because it, it will always take energy to remove an electron, a negatively charged particle from a nucleus, a positively charged particle. Coulomb's law, guys. Coulomb's law. Larger values of ionization energy means that the electron is more tightly bound and hence it's harder to remove. It's usually measured in kilojoules per mole. The amount of energy required to remove success successive electrons from an atom that has already been ionized steadily increases. So obviously I1 is less than I2 is less than I3. Why do you think that is? There are two reasons for the aforementioned trend. The first is that the second electron is being removed from a positively charged species rather than a neutral one. So as per Coulomb's law, more energy is, is required. And the second is that removing the first electron leads to less electrostatic repulsion and a slightly less electron shielding. And so the attraction to the nucleus is stronger. Makes sense. We do this all day, guys. Again, successive ionization energy for an element steadily increases. Notice the, uh, the increase. Notice how massive this increase is, by the way, between lithium, the uh, first ionization energy for lithium, and the second one for lithium. Massive. Huge. Huge. There's something very valuable to understand in this table. And that is that the energy required to remove electrons from a filled core shell, like what is lithium, see it has 1s0 right now, um, is so large that it is impossible under normal chemical conditions to remove them. Look at how huge it is to remove the third ionization energy, the energy cost for beryllium to remove an electron from that, 
from the 1s1 shell huge 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 therefore it's essentially forbidden under normal chemical conditions it is forbidden you're not getting that much energy under normal chemical conditions so the chemistry of elements are dominated by specific valencies very specific valences you never really see in in normal chemistry lithium 2 plus you only see lithium plus and that's because the ionization energy to form lithium 2 plus is so extremely large that you just don't get it so coming off that the alkali metals are dominated by plus one valencies because again to remove an electron from an inner shell is forbidden the energy cost is way too high to ionize that to lithium 2 plus so it only loses one electron for the most part and so all of these, these alkali earth metals in this first column are dominated by plus one valencies because again it is forbidden to remove electrons from any more. Um, and then the alkaline earth metals are dominated by plus two valencies again because it doesn't take a lot of energy to remove the first electron, doesn't take a lot of energy to remove the second one, but it takes a huge amount of energy to remove the third one because again that is in within an inner shell. Same thing for all these guys. So again, and we can do this all day in terms of ionization energy. Aluminum is dominated by well, let me not jump the gun. So this is a question for you. What valence should aluminum be dominated by? What about beryllium and what about potassium? So let's look at aluminum. Where is it? Aluminum is right here. So it can lose the plus one. It can form aluminum plus. It can form aluminum plus two and it can form aluminum plus three. Actually, the valence is dominated by aluminum plus three. Because again, it doesn't take a lot of energy to remove this. So in a normal chemical condition, it's very likely that aluminum will form aluminum plus three. How about beryllium? Where's beryllium? Beryllium is right here. Beryllium should dominate, be, be dominated by beryllium plus two. How about potassium? K plus. You already know that just from biology probably. But now you know chemi chemi chemistry why, why that is. Because it is forbidden to remove from inner shells. Those inner shells are much more attracted to the nucleus than the outer valence shells. Okay. And so they're attracted much heavy heavier. They f face a higher the effective. And so they're attracted more. So that's why it's forbidden. In terms of energy. So again, another review. You should know that the valence electron configuration for, let's say, nitrogen is going to be 2s2, 2p3. You should know that the valence configuration for sulfur is going to be 3s2, 3p4. You should know the valence con electron configuration for chlorine is going to be, uh, let's see, 3s2, 3p5. Again, you know that because you know this. You know the block. This is the S block. This is the D block. Okay, this is the P block. And this is the F blocks. If you know that, then you can very easily get the valence electron configuration. And if you know the valence electron configuration, you can then determine what valency the, the element more likely to adopt. Obviously, since chlorine is right next to this electron configuration here, um, it's going to want to adopt the noble gas configuration and form and gain an electron from chlorine negative to form that noble gas stable configuration because it's less reactive because all the electrons are paired. But again, we didn't get there yet in terms of electron affinity, so we let's let's defer that for a conversation for a later time. Uh, again, this is just another review. Notice this trend of this this um, successive ionization energy increasing tremendously when we get to that filled inner shell. Once we take out all the electrons from the valence shell and we get to the inner filled shell, the electron uh, ionization energy is exquisitely higher. Exquisitely. Look at how high that is. Okay, so that's just putting that notion to you, running that notion down. So There's another exercise for you. Pause the video and try this. Right, it's aluminum. Why is it aluminum? Well, it's aluminum because the fourth ionization energy for aluminum is going to be um, in, a, in an inner shell, and that's going to be extremely high. Whereas carbon, you can remove four electrons and still be in the valence shell. Fluorine, you can remove four electrons and still be in the valence shell. But for aluminum, you're going to get out of the valence shell and into an inner shell, and that's going to cost a ton of energy to remove that ion, to remove that electron and form an ion. Uh, exercise for you again. Answer is boron. By way of review now. Ionization energy increases up and to the right, up and to the right, as denoted by these arrows. All of this is really due to our little friends shielding the effective and electronic repulsion. As we're moving from left to right, we're increasing protons and electrons, but since it's in the same principal quantum number n shell, they're not very good at shielding, and the effective is increasing, hence the amount of energy it takes to remove an electron from the atom is increasing due to that increased Q on that Coulomb's law causing an increased force of attraction between the nucleus and the outermost electron. As we move down the column, we're adding protons and electrons just like before, but we're also adding electrons into inner shells and those inner shell electrons are very good at shielding. 
says that there is a huge disparity between the Z of any given atom going down a column and the Z effective, such that the Z effective of cesium is very small compared to what it would be compared to its nuclear charge. But of course, ionization energy, as I already told you, is decreasing going down the column, and that is because of our concept of Z effective and electronic repulsion. Because while the Z effective trend is slightly increasing or constant, the electronic repulsion by these electrons is massive, such that as you go down the column, the amount of electronic repulsion makes it easier for you to remove an electron from an atom. The amount of energy it takes to remove an electron from an atom as you go down the column is decreasing, hence the opposite way is increasing. Again, note the trend ionization energy increases up and to the right on the periodic table. Again, here's another graph here. I mean, here's another figure. So it's a plot of periodic variation for the first ionization energy of the atomic with atomic numbers with the first six rows. Um, so notice as we go from this is what this is 2s1, 2s2, 2p1, 2p2, 2p3, 2p4. There's a break here. It seems to be that 2p3, the ionization energy for 2p3 is actually higher than 2p4. Why is that? I mean, it shouldn't be. Well, under normal conditions, right? It shouldn't be. So why is that? We said earlier that there is inherent stability in half-filled shells. From NP3 to NP4, that adds enough electron repulsion, so it makes sense that the ionization for energy for NP3 is higher than that of NP4. Okay, it's about parallel spin and electron repulsion. This par these in this guy and this NP3, the spins are in parallel. That tends to have inherent stability and lower in energy. And so that coupled with the fact that you add electron repulsion when you add um, electrons to an orbital with or which already contains electrons, that means then the NP3 is more stable. Those electrons are high, more highly attracted and should cost more energy to remove those electrons than, than this guy here. But then they, they, the, um, the pattern picks itself back up again in terms of adding electrons to the orbitals. Okay, again, this is just ionization energies again. We noted earlier that the successive ionization energies for the um, metals plus the um, lanthanides, or maybe I didn't mention it, but I'm mentioning it now, that these are changing very little as we move up into the right. The reason for that is that these elements lose their 4ns or their 4ns, well, their ns orbitals before their n-1d or n-2f orbitals, respectively. The inner n-1d and the n-2f are closer to the nucleus than the ns shell and are extremely effective at shielding, reducing the effective. As Z increases, Z effective barely changes because of all the shields. So essentially what I'm saying here, and I'm going to say it in more, a more um, general terms, more layman terms. We have so much shielding here and here that even though Z effective increases as we move to the right, it's not even felt. It's really not even felt by the valence electron because the shielding is just so good. We have so much shields. And because of that, because successive ionization energy changes so little across a row, these elements have important horizontal properties in terms of chemical properties in addition to expected vertical similarity. Because again, I told you earlier that if some if an element has similar valence electron shells in terms of like if it if it's 2s1 or 3s1, okay, that, that kind of similar valence, they're gonna act similarly in chemical reactions. And so here, even though they you know normally it's just horizontal, right? All these have plus one and all these have plus two, so they all act very similar. These guys all have tend to form plus uh plus two or plus three. And so they have similar properties in terms of reactions. The transition metals tend to form plus two, and then the lanthanides tend to form plus three. Exercise. Use the periodic table to predict which element had the lowest first ionization energy. Okay, so why don't we? Why don't I help you work through it? Well, the answer is rubidium. Why is it rubidium? Well, because it's lowest first ionization energy. I mean, we can sit here and do the explanation about Z effective again, or we can just remember the trend, ionization energy increases up and to the right. So the answer is rubidium. I mean, I, I, I've explained it too many times. So we'll move on to this bad boy here. We use the periodic table to predict which element has the lowest first ionization energy. And the answer is strontium. You should know why. The periodic trends, electron affinity. Electron affinity is the energy value when an electron is added to an atom. So before we talked about ionization, which is the energy it takes to remove an electron from an atom, now we're talking about adding an electron to an atom. Again, electron affinity is the amount of energy released or absorbed when an electron is added to an atom. Again, here's this notion here. 
And, and notice when we have gases, by the way, this is all done using gases. So when we talk about solution chemistry and aqueous solutions later on in the, in, in, in the game here, we're actually not going to be using gases, so things are going to change a little bit in terms of what you might expect for reactions. But, okay, that's just... Anyway, electron affinity can be positive, negative, or neutral. All right, again, because it, it can take it can take energy. Um, if it's positive, then it that means that energy is added when the electron is added. So it takes energy to put that on. We have to force that electron on there. Or it could be negative. Energy can be released when we add that electron. So when we add a chlorine, we add electron to chlorine gas, and we form chlorine negative or chlorine anion. The energy is released. Energy is actually released. Again, why do you think that is? Well, just judging from the period, its position on the periodic table, it would probably like to add an electron one because the effective is very high. So it has a very strong attractive force, and it would like to add more electrons to that attractive force. And so, and it would like to form a noble gas configuration. So it has an EA of 348.6 kilojoules per mole. Beryllium. We add electron to beryllium to form beryllium anion. The it's not a very stable position again because its position on a periodic table tells you that it's not a very very favorable reaction to add a negative to add an electron to a beryllium atom because again it's it's the effect that is not very high and nitrogen um, it actually doesn't really like adding an electron it, well it doesn't really care like the, the, the very little energy released or absorbed when you add an electron to nitrogen yeah it has the highest effective but it's also very small and so I think that that kind of notion is the, the the notion is that although it has a high Z effective, it's also very small, so it doesn't have a lot of space to add an electrons, a lot of repulsion that's there, and so they kind of cancel each other out. Those two fighting factors there. Electron affinity, in general, becomes more negative as we move from left to right. Becoming more negative again. What I mean by negative, I mean it occurs with a release in energy. It's a favorable reaction. Electron affinity, again, is the amount of again, energy gained or released when an electron is added to the atom. Okay, so there are some exceptions to this, and they're not they're numerous. We're not really going to get too far into this, but let me just mention a few. And this is more to, to integrate rather than to, to memorize. All right, let's look at potassium and calcium. Which one do you think is going to have a higher electron affinity? And before you answer, pause and say to yourself, hey... All right, I have to think about Z-effective, I have to think about shielding, I have to think about electronic repulsion, I have to think about half-filled and fully-filled orbitals. Then go. Okay, good. I hope you had a chance to pause. Looking at calcium, it is 4s2, is it not? And in order to add an electron to that system, would you not have to add to the uh, 3D? Wouldn't you have to break into that 3D, that higher energy subshell? Whereas with potassium, you don't really have to do that, do you? You don't really have to break into another subshell in order to add an electron to that system. So that actually is going to have an electron affinity that is more negative than calcium. And in fact, in this first family, the alkali metals versus the alkaline earth metals, uh, the alkali metals are always going to have a more negative electron affinity, a lower, uh, a more negative electron affinity, despite the trend. Okay, that's another exception. There are others, which hopefully you can pick up on. Okay, and that's going to be in the problem sets. You'll notice it, I think. So again, the re the rest of this trend, the electron affinity is becoming more negative as we go up. And why don't we just briefly discuss the effective in this case again. Moving from left to right, Z effective is increasing. If Z effective is increasing, the force of attraction is increasing. Hence, it becomes more favorable or more negative it occurs with a release in energy when an electron is added to an atom that has a stronger nuclear um, Z effective charge. Okay, how about going down? As we know, Z effective, as we go down this column, Z effective is basically staying constant, slightly increasing, really. Um, but also, the electronic repulsion is massive. And so, as we go down the column, um, we are becoming less negative in our electron affinity. Um, less negative would mean less uh, favorable and less favorable. Why would it be less favorable? Well, electronic repulsion there is massive. And so the opposite direction is more favorable, more negative. Here is an exercise for you to work on. Just pause the video and I'll walk you through it as well. Between SN, SB, and SE, which do you predict have the most negative electron affinity? 
what did this mean in terms of reaction favorability? Can the electron configuration of the atom also tell you about reaction favorability? Well, we have to just identify these suckers on the periodic table and use our trend. Here's selenium, here's SN, here's SB. Trend is up and to the right, more negative, and selenium is obviously more up and to the right. And so that is going to be the more negative electron affinity, the more favorable of the three reactions. So answer one is to SE, and it is the most favorable reaction, as I just mentioned, as it is occurred with a release in energy and has the most the largest release in energy, aka the more negative release in energy. And that would be called a release in energy reaction is called a exothermic reaction, where the gain of energy is a endothermic reaction. Can electron configuration of the atom also tell you about reaction favorability? Yes, it can. This selenium has a electronic configuration of AR, 4s2, 3d10, 4p4, as represented here. And it would love to gain two electrons and complete its noble gas configuration. And so you can expect it to do that. Okay, second exercise. Um, pause the video, try it. Uh, the periodic trends, electronegativity. There have been many methods to develop, develop to quantitatively describe the tendency of an element to gain or lose electrons. But the most important measurement to understand is called electronegativity. Electronegativity is defined as the relative ability of an atom to attract electrons to itself in a chemical compound. Electronegativity increases up and to the right. Okay, it increases like this, up and to the right. On the Pauling scale, the electronegativity values range from 0 to 4.0. Again, this is within a chemical compound now. When you talk about electronegativity, you're talking about within a chemical compound, the relative ability to attract electrons to itself. Fluorine is the most highly electronegative atom, and cesium is actually the largest and least electronegative of the stable elements. The stable elements, these are unstable, so we don't really consider these stable elements now. Cesium is the most, the least electronegative. This is something you probably already know, and this is the metalloid line okay this this is what cuts off metals from non-metals and with uh, everything found here the metalloids and there there are so okay so we're gonna go through a few figures of electronegativity increasing notice it's increasing up and to the right <clears throat> boom 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 can you explain the breaks what about this break right here between one two three four three d four s one uh, really this is four s one three d five and then it's gonna be four s two three d five why is there a break there? I told you there's stability associated with half-filled and fully filled orbitals. When you hit that 3D5, it's almost like you're getting into a new shell when you have to add electrons, so it drops. Just like it drops here, it drops here because there's a stability associated there. Again, uh, electronegativity ranges from 0 to 4.0 on the Pauling scale. X is greater than or equal to 2.2 is high electronegativity. X lower than or equal to 1.8 is low electronegativity. Elements with high electronegativity have very negative electron affinity and very large ionization potentials. So they are, as a general notion, non-metal than electrical insulators that tend to gain electrons in chemical reactions. They are known as oxidants. People with high, these guys are known as oxidants. They tend to be reduced. Okay, oxidants oxidize other molecules. They tend to form, to make other molecules lose electrons and they gain those electrons. Elements with low electronegativity have either positive or small negative values and small ionization potentials. They are generally metal than good electrical conductors, and they tend to lose their valence electrons in chemical reactions, i.e. they are reductants. And I'm just going to mention this now. For, let's forget about electronegativity for a second. Let's, talk, let's think about the effective, because this is what this is all about. These transition metals, these metals, why are metals good conductors? We just, talk, we just said it. But metals are good conductors because they have all this electron shielding. And they have all this electron shielding and they have very low Z effectives. That means that then within a metal, right, they can, the electrons are, can more easily jump from one metal to the other because they're so loosely held to the nucleus. And so they can jump from one metal nucleus to the other and then that, that's conduction, that's movement of charge. Again, current is coulombs per second. It's just charge moving. So when you move charge like that, when you have the ability to move charge like that because the Z effective is so low, you can form, you can act, be a good conductor. And so that's why these guys are not good conducted. There's the effect of it so high, the electrons are held so tightly that they don't move. They do not move very much. They move, right? But they don't move from elect from atom to atom very easily. And again, we also mentioned metalloids. Metalloids have mixed mixed characteristics, right? Um, they're not, some of them are brittle, like the non-metals, and some of them are very metallic, like the metals 
metallic shiny character. And again, they have mixed characters. They're about like right here. The Metaloid line's about right about here. Again, note the trend. Electronegativity increases up and to the right. So arrange the other exercise. Arrange these in order of increasing electronegativity and classify each of the metal, non-metal, and semi-metal and metalloid. Go ahead and do that. That's the answers. Again, if you're your metalloid, if you're on that metalloid line or semi-metal line. Another exercise, pause the video, do it. Again, periodic trends. Electronegativity increases up and to the right. See that in green. Uh, atomic radius increases, decreases up and to the right. Ionization energy increases up and to the right. Electron affinity becomes more negative up and to the right. Why are these trends the way that they are? Z effective, shielding, electronic repulsion, and exceptions can often be explained by looking at the electronic configuration and thinking about the exceptions to the rule based on that. I remember there are exceptions associated with half filled and fully filled orbitals. Half filled and fully filled orbitals are very stable. We talked about how it's forbidden to remove electrons from inner shells, and so um, the valencies of, of elements are usually dominated by specific valencies, like calcium is dominated by plus two, potassium is dominated by plus one. Um, we talked about how elements like to form noble gas configurations or pseudo noble gas configurations. And they do that by either gaining or removing electrons. And they, they do like to do that because they want to fill their orbitals so they are less reactive. Unfilled orbitals are reactive. They have a position where an electron can take. And so they can react with other molecules, gain or lose electrons, oxidize or reduce, you know. And um, <clears throat> that can happen. And so when they have filled orbitals, that doesn't happen anymore. And so, so then they are more stable. Again, if you know the electron configuration, you can explain a great deal of the chemistry of the element. We talked about the principal quantum numbers N, L, M, L, and M, S. N is the shell, right? It indicates the average distance of the nucleus and the energy of the electron. The L is the azimuthal quantum numbers. Describe the shape of the region of space occupied by the electron. Can have values of 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way up to N minus 1. And those 0, 1, 2, 3 correspond to S, P, D, and F, respectively. We talked, and that, again, the lot value depend on the previous principal quantum number. And then we talked about the magnetic quantum number, which is the slot or the orbital, M, L. And that describes the orientation in the region of space occupied by the electron with respect to an applied magnetic field, right? You know, it can be on the PX, PY, or PD um, uh, axis. And we talked about spin quantum number, MS, and that's that's all because of the Pauli exclusion principle, right? That's why we need to have that spin quantum number. And that the spin is what what's spinning or, or is, is the subject of speculation, but what's indisputable is that it's the magnetic moment. That magnetic moment of the electron, right? That dipole can either be oriented with or against the magnetic field. With the magnetic field, is spin up. Okay, plus one half, and that is lower in energy than slightly lower in energy than spin down, or minus one half. Again, knowing the electron configuration that comes from okay, the um, the principal quantum numbers allows us then to determine much of the chemistry of the element, and it's extremely important for you to know that. And it's really the basis for the effective and understanding the effective and understanding all of this. The effective is really the basis, but again, all that comes from knowing the electron configuration, which is knowing the principal quantum number. So you need to know that for the MCAT. We talked about S, P, and D orbitals. The P, S orbital is just spherical in shape, and then, you know, as we increase M, we increase magnitude of any orbital. And we increase L, we increase complexity of the orbital and the size of the orbital. We talked about P orbitals, which have bilobe shape and can be oriented on any ax X, Y, or Z axis. Whichever axis they're oriented on, the remaining axes you have our nodal planes for them. We talked about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, so which said that the more we know about the energy of a of, a, of an electron, the less we know about position, well, momentum, which is very related to uh, energy. We talked about the Pauli exclusion principle, which said that no two electrons can have the same four principal quantum numbers. We talked about the outbound building up principle, which said that we add electrons to the lowest energy orbital first, which are spinned in parallel, because spinned in parallel are lower, en lower in energy than the, well, that's on the rule, that's on the bus rule, which said that we add electrons with their spin in parallel to um, different orbitals before we fill up orbitals that already contain electrons. That's the bus rule, right? You don't get onto a bus and share a seat with someone when you can get your own seat first. So now we'll apply our knowledge with oxidation reduction reactions With the, after that little review. An oxidation reduction reaction or redox reaction is a reaction in which there is a transfer of electrons from one species to another. Oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. One of the mnemonics, a very common mnemonic, is Leo the Lion says GER. Leo stands for lose electrons oxidation. GER stands for gain electrons reduction. Leo the Lion says GER. Leo stands for loss of electrons oxidation. GER stands for gain of electrons reduction. The oxidant oxidizes the reductant. Okay? The oxidant itself is reduced. That's something you have to get, you have to understand. Oxidation, the oxidant 
gets reduced, but it oxidizes the reductant. The reductant, um, the reductant reduces the another compound, and it itself is oxidized. Okay. Uh, I like to just remember reduction is the gain of electrons, then I can remember the opposite is for oxidation. But you can remember this any which way you want. All right, so let's move on then to a couple examples and some rules. So oxidant plus reductant forms then an oxidation reduction reaction or a redox reaction. So I hear this periodic table to help us out for our next examples. Again, these are examples of oxidation reduction reactions. We're going to go through the rules in the next slide, but I'm going to just going to tell you now. The elemental state of any element, any element that in its elemental state, the oxidation state is plus zero. It's zero. I put plus, but it's really zero. It doesn't mean it. plus or minus it doesn't matter. Sodium again, it's an elemental state plus zero. So in this case, that the this is this thing gets gained electrons, so it's reduced, and this one it gets oxidized. So okay, so we have sodium oxide here. It's balanced. So oxygen had then how it now has an oxidation state of negative two. That thing gained electrons. It gained electrons. So it acted as an oxidant. It itself was reduced. Sodium. Sodium actually lost electrons, right? And that makes sense, right? Oxygen is supposed to gain. How do I know this is negative two? How do I know this is not something else? Well, oxygen from the from the periodic table of elements should gain negative two electrons to form the noble gas configuration. That's the most ideal configuration for it. So it should gain two electrons. Sodium. Well, how do I know sodium is plus one and not something else? Well, sodium's position right here. It is forbidden to remove electrons past the um, past in the inner shell, and so sodium can only lose one electron and form neon configuration. And so that's why sodium is plus one and oxygen is negative two. And then again, I know this is it's supposed to be um, it's supposed to be neutral atom, and so these have to cancel out each other, and and they do. And so we'll move on to the next example. So we have C6H12 plus oxygen is formed, then CO2 plus H2O. All right, that's that's the combustion reaction. So why don't we look at oxygen first? The initial oxidation state is plus zero, and then the final oxidation state is negative two in both these compounds. So that guy then got reduced, okay? It gained electron. It acted, it acted as an oxidant, so it oxidized this, this carbon compound. So the initial hydrogen um, oxidation state is plus one. Since we have 12 of them, we have plus 12 here. And then the initial uh, oxidation state for carbon is negative two. And since we have six of them, we have negative 12. And that cancels each other out to form an even number, a neutral atom, neutral element, I mean neutral compound rather. And then CO2, the carbon went from a an oxidation state of negative two to plus four. That's a big jump. Okay, that means that it lost six electrons. So if it lost electrons, it was oxidized. Okay, and another one. We have aluminum plus oxygen um, formed then aluminum dialuminum dialuminum oxide, I guess. Dialuminum oxide or aluminum oxide. Actually, you could probably just call it aluminum oxide. And again, aluminum was initially plus zero, then it formed plus three. So then it was oxidized. Oxygen was plus zero at first, the oxidation state is plus zero, and then it formed a negative two. How do I know, again, how do I know it's likely to form plus three? Aluminum's right here on the periodic table. It is forbidden to remove more than three electrons because then you're getting into inner shells and the ionization energy would be huge. Okay, so if we know the electron configuration, we can explain a great deal of chemistry, right? That's how we're getting that plus three. That's how we know it's plus three and not something else. Oxygen, again, we already talked about it. Oxygen is going to form that negative two to form that noble gas configuration in electron affinity. All right, so again, we're going to talk about the rules for assigning oxidation states. We did them in passing just now, and now we're going to go formal. So the first rule, the oxidation state of an atom in any pure element, whether monoatomic, diatomic, or polyatomic, is zero. So again, it's a pure element, and it's plus zero. Plus zero. The oxidation state for any monoatomic ion is the same as its charge. For example, sodium plus is plus one, chlorine is chloride. It's a negative one. All right, get it? Sodium, and we know why that that formed that oxidation state, right? We already talked about it. The oxidation state of fluorine in chemical compounds is always negative one. Other halogens usually have an oxidation of negative one, but they have exceptions. Those exceptions are with oxygen or other halogens. So let's look at this compound first. The carbon has an oxidation state of negative two. The hydrogen always has an oxidation state of plus one, which we haven't talked about yet, but that's a rule. And so altogether we have plus three here, and then fluorine is always negative one, like we just said. So that's that one's out. And then again, it has to add up to a neutral compound. So you know you made a mistake if it doesn't add up to a neutral compound, unless the compound isn't neutral. It has to add up to the charge that the compound has. So let's see that chlorine. Chlorine's negative one, right? That's the rule. And then carbon is plus four. So it adds up to a neutral compound because we have four chlorine, so negative four plus negative four is neutral. Chlorine again. Uh, chlorine in this case actually because it's combined combined with oxygen. Um, oxygen always has an oxidation state of negative two, so it's, well, not always, but most of the time. So seven times negative two is negative 14, then, then chlorine has to have plus seven. How do I know that chlorine can adopt this oxidation state of plus seven? Normally it just adds one, but it also has seven electrons in its valence shell, so it can lose up to seven electrons. 
Again, because again, if you go move more than seven, you're going to be in a forbidden state because the ionization is going to be huge. Fourth rule, hydrogen is assigned an oxidation state of plus one in its compound with non-metals and minus one with metals. So this is a hydride. A hydride is a negative one. So if you're with a metal, the hydrogen is going to have an oxidation state of negative one. It's a hydride. The metals, again, they have such low the effectives that they will actually give up an electron to hydrogen. And the fifth rule that oxygen is normally assigned an oxidation state of negative two in compounds with two exceptions. In compounds that contain oxygen fluorine bond or oxygen 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 bonds. The oxygen oxidation state of oxygen is determined by the oxidation states of other elements present. One of the things to watch out for is um, peroxides. In peroxide, the oxidation oxidation state of oxygen is actually negative one because they're bound to other oxygens. That's something you might might see on the MCAT. The sum of oxidation states of all the atoms in a neutral molecule or ion must be equal to the charge on the molecule of the ion. We already went over that. Here is an exercise for you to do. Here are the answers. And I'm going to go ahead and talk about ammonium ion here because I think it's, it's critical and a good example of us to talk about the distinction between oxidation states and formal charge, which is a source of confusion for a lot of people. Both of these methods are ways of keeping track of electrons. The oxidation state method helps us keep track of electrons and what happens to them in redox reactions. And, and generally in that method, uh, most the most electronegative atom is generally assigned the electrons of a bond. Whereas in the formal charge method, that's used uh, um, to determine the charge of an atom in a molecule or a polyatomic ion, so the whole polyatomic ion, uh, would have if all the bonding electrons were divided equally between atoms and the bond. All of these are superficial bookkeeping methods to determine uh, or keep track of electrons. It's not like the molecule knows what this formal charge or oxidation state method is. It's just how, how we scientists understand um, these uh, compounds better. So the rules for oxidation state method is per previous slide, what we've been doing. Now the formal charge, however, has its own rules. So the rules are as follows. Divide bonds equally so each bond is split evenly so, so if you have a single bond you know there's two electrons in each one of those bonds and so then each atom that that the bond is connecting gets an electron if it's a double bond then two electrons for each atom etc lone pairs go to the attached atom so if a nitrogen has two lone uh, two lone pair uh, lone pair of electrons then it gets those and then you just compare the number of electrons that you counted up to the elemental state of that atom to determine the charge on that compound, that is the formal charge on that compound. So let's do that. First, let's do what we, we know how to do, which is the oxidation state method. And you may not know how to do this yet. That's okay. I'm just saying in general what we just already went through. Plus one, there's four of them, plus four. So I know then using my rules that whatever's left is going to get have to make sure that this compound is overall positive one so the nitrogen in this case is negative three yes okay now the formal charge the formal charge so let's deal with the nitrogen first i noticed that there's four bonds around nitrogen so that's four electrons around nitrogen i don't see any lone pairs and if that's the case i count here one two three four this nitrogen has four electrons in its valence shell, where normally it has five. So that's going to be overall um, plus, plus one or plus. Now let's do the formal charge for the hydrogen. All right. Hydrogen normally has one. Ele well, let me just count here. It has one bond here. So that means that it's going to get one electron. So this one gets one electron. This one gets one electron. This one gets one. This one gets one. I compare that to its normal elemental state, where normally in its valence shell it has one electron. So its formal charge is zero, 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 all zero. And you notice that the oxidation state charges are much different than the formal charge. And that's why this is an important distinction to make. Where you're going to see this the most is with polyatomic ions. That is, ions that have more than one atom as part of the compound, poly. And a lot of people just choose to memorize polyatomic ions. And I think in some way and format, I guess all of us do kind of memorize them. But this formal charge and this oxidation state method is an important way to derive those charges and also to understand better how 
amino acids kind of get their charges and what to do with the lone pairs on nitrogens and such and such, which we'll go more, more over during biochemistry, but this is the critical concept. Okay, and now we're just going to very quickly run through the oxidation state method. Again, the, the likelihood that you're going to actually have to use the oxidation state method in a on the MCAT is slim to none. It's just, it is one of the things tested, but they rarely put, the, it takes too long to do it. But I'm going to mention it just, you know, for completeness, and it helps you learn the different compounds. And how, you know, if a lot of times on the MCAT you're giving words, you're not giving the elements, you're just giving words on how to name things. So this will help you in naming things and recognizing things. So the first rule that you write the unbalanced chemical equation for the reaction, showing the reactants and the products. So again, sometimes you're just giving the names of these things, and you have to know what these things are. Assign oxidation state, which we haven't covered. Assign oxidation states to all the atoms in the reactants and the product, and determine which atoms change oxidation states. So we write the initial oxidation states, and we then we know what changes. So obviously this guy, I forgot what this is, arsenic. Arsenic goes from plus 5 to negative 3, and zinc goes from plus 0 to plus 2. So arsenic was reduced, it gained electron, and zinc was oxidized, it lost electrons. The next step is to write separate equations for the oxidation and reduction, showing the atoms that are oxidized and reduced, and the number of electrons accepted or donated. This guy obviously got eight electrons, this one obviously lost two electrons. Then we have to balance it. So multiply the oxidation and reduction such that they can contain the same number of electrons. We have to cancel out the electrons, because you never see electrons in balanced reactions, right? So we did that, right? We multiplied by four to get eight electrons on, and then we can cancel. We add a reaction and then cancel. So we add the reactions, cancel, and then we add back into the original equation all the other guys that we looked at. We simplify this to just look at what's changing, because that makes it easier for us. And then we put arsenic back where arsenic is supposed to be, which is H3 and O4. <clears throat> okay, so then we do that, and um, we then add the two can and cancel the electron. Then we check the total charges on this. We check the total charge, and we find that on the product side we have plus 8, and on the reactant side we have 0. But obviously, from our initial reaction, we had a neutral. It was neutral. The total charge was zero. So it has to be zero. It has to be zero. It has to equal the total charge that we initially started with. So then we have to balance that by adding uh, H plus OH minus, respectively, for acidic or basic solution. So if you did this reaction in an acidic solution, you add protons. If you did this reaction in a basic solution, you add um, hydroxide ions. So now the reactants charges are equal. And then we have to balance it by adding water to each side to make sure that the hydrogen and the oxygen are balanced, which we did here. We added four hydrogens. Initially, we had eight protons, then we added four hydrogens. We added eight protons to the left, so we had to add four um, water molecules to the right to balance the hydrogen and the oxygen. And then we check, just check to make sure this is all right, which it is. Okay, so this is where you would do it on your own. Uh, just a, a, some other a few things to mention about oxidation reduction reactions because it's worth mentioning. We're going to talk about it again when we actually just cover oxidation reactions on its own. But um, so iron, ten, so some metals react with acids to form hydrogen gas. You need to know that because when you get a question about what's bubbling, what's bubbling in a reaction and the, the metal involved, it's probably hydrogen gas. All right, so iron plus hyd hydrogen chloride forms FeCl2 or, or iron. T well, what? It's iron 2 chloride, right? Iron 2 chloride. How do I know that? How do I know it's iron 2 chloride? Well, there's 2 chlorine, and that's negative 1, so this has to be plus 2. And hydrogen gas. So we have lead plus 2 protons, or and 2, again, this is just representation of an acid, forms Pb2 and hydrogen gas. So, okay, this is what's called the activity series. The activity series tells us it's essentially a, a list of what is easy to oxidize and what is very difficult to oxidize. So increasing ease of oxidation as we move from bottom to top. Notice that, one thing to notice here is notice what reacts with acids and what doesn't. Or what reacts with water and what doesn't. You put lithium in water, it's going to form hydrogen gas. Because remember, water is a very weak acid, but it's an acid. So you put hot water in, in with these guys and they will actually react to form steam. I mean, to form H2. These guys actually need a, a good acid, maybe a simple acid like acetic acid to form H2. And these guys will not dissolve in simple acid, gold, mercury, platinum, the money metals. The money metals are very hard to oxidize. So if you ever see gold, platinum, they're not very likely to be oxidized. So you have to choose between, and this and this is the, uh, the activity series, what we use to choose between what's going to get oxidized and what's going to get reduced. So this is how you use this. So anything, any element will reduce a compound below it in series. So let's say you're looking at magnesium and zinc. Magnesium is higher on this table than zinc. So magnesium will reduce 
zinc salts, but not vice versa. Zinc cannot reduce magnesium. Magnesium will reduce zinc. Active metals lie on the top of this chart. Okay, the activity series. Active metals lie at the top. Inactive metals or inert metals lie at the bottom. Okay, these are inert. Okay, again, the money metals are inert. Gold, platinum, silver. Okay, they're inert. They don't like getting, they don't like oxidizing, which is good. We want them to be stable. <laughs> You know, sometimes on the MCAT, you won't really be told what, you know, what is what. So you have to remember that the money metals don't dissolve. Also, you can use the periodic table, but that's not always going to be uh, effective because if you look at lithium and potassium, you know that ionization energy increases up and to the right. And lithium is higher on the uh, periodic table than potassium, so you, you're probably saying that these should be flopped. Well, the reality of it is that there are things that happen within... Uh, solutions of, of water that don't happen in the in the gaseous phase and all of the trends that we looked at all considered these elements in the gaseous phase so th things like the entropy of water molecules and and other thermodynamic considerations are, are what kind of bring about these changes that are unexpected based on our knowledge of the trends instead of trying to understand that as much as they should just say remember this kind of remember the relative thing here but they're never going to ask you the difference between lithium and potassium because that's not too close together but they might ask you the difference between lithium and chromium, and then at that point you can use then your knowledge of the element, the periodic table of elements and stuff like that. Okay, that's it. If you have some questions, you can do these exercises on your own. Do practice problems. If you're not doing practice problems, you're not going to, you're not, you know, you're not retaining enough. Yeah, just listening to my voice is great. Let's get you the content, but you just have to practice. Now, for those of you who have been doing practice problems as we've gone through, you don't deserve that scolding. And the only scoldings I ever do are with good intention anyway. If you made it this far, I think you're doing a great first step. And I think taking a small break is reasonable. And coming back and banging out some practice problems would be your next best bet. If you're watching this on YouTube, I encourage you to come and check out our website, MCATDisciple.com, and see if we can help you prepare for the MCAT. We're succinct, comprehensive, high yield. We review all MCAT topics in less than 100 hours, and our going rate is $5.99, a fraction of the industry norm, and I'd love to help you prepare for the MCAT. Thanks, and have a great evening, everyone.